Um, really thrilled to have a, a guest here with us this morning uh, to share uh, here at the bridge. Uh, before I introduce uh, our guests, I just want to make mention of a couple of things. One is um, this is the last Sabbath for a couple of people who have been really huge in helping us here at the bridge behind the scenes as well as other events associated with Young Adult Ministry, and that's Rob Bounds and Sharon Bounds. And I don't think they're in here right now, but I just want it to be recorded on record that we at The Bridge want to express our sincere uh, gratefulness and appreciation for their service in this church. From what I understand, they are moving, and this is their last Sabbath here. Um, so if you guys would, I know you may not even know them, but I want to hear really, really loud Bridge applause for Rob and Sharon. If you would do that for me, I'd really appreciate it. Amen. Uh, there's just a lot of folks working behind the scenes in terms of audio, uh, technical side of things that you don't get to see a whole lot of, and we appreciate all of them. Uh, and so when a couple of them have to take off and, and there's a change in their world, we want to acknowledge them as well. Uh, one other thing is, again, as Liberty mentioned, Pack the Forest is today. Really, really, really excited. It'll be our biggest one yet. We have more volunteers than we've ever had uh, volunteer for Pack the Forest. And so uh, really, really excited. Um, we're continuing the fundraising, though. We're not quite there. Um, we've topped over, we're over 15000 maybe approaching $16,000. We need to get a little bit over 20000 So we've got, some, we've got some ground to make up, but what we all know about churches is that December is a huge month for giving, um, and we're grateful for December. Um, so if you can give um, any amount, this week I've had people just tell me or say, hey, how much do you need? Or, um, hey, we're going to give 500 we're going to give 400 or, we're going to give $20, you know. Uh, please feel free to do that. Please give and specifically give to Pack the Forest, and it'll help us uh, provide all the meals and all the backpacks, as Liberty mentioned earlier. You can also stop by our booth if you want to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, if you haven't registered, um, you really can't register. We're, we're sold out on registrations, um, but you can certainly give. We will take your money even though you can't be there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so if you, will, um, if you will do that, you can stop at our booth. You can donate there or just mark your tithe envelope and drop it in somewhere. Really, really pleased to have uh, Pastor Carl Ricketts here. Um, he is the Director of Pastoral Care for Florida Hospital South. So I guess technically he's chaplain uh, Carl Ricketts, but I also see you as a pastor, but he's, and he's a good friend. Would you again give a warm round of applause for Pastor Carl, Carl Ricketts? Happy Sabbath, everyone. I want to thank Pastor Bernie uh, for the introduction and also Pastor Patterson for allowing me to grace the pulpit of uh, Forest Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. I recognize some family. Uh, my wife is here um, with my children and, and my cousins and my auntie as well, and fellow colleagues in ministry. I see uh, Minister Chaplain Pastor Igor Melnik and his, and his wife. Um, it is a pleasure to worship with you all. I first want to thank uh, the musicians, the band, for bringing us into a spirit of worship. Um, thank you so much. The Lord worked through you. I, I came in and I felt the Holy Spirit um, from the singing and from the playing of instruments. Uh, my wife always tells me, be brief, brother, be brief. <laughs> she tells me I have about 20 minutes. Pastor Bernie told me I have 25 minutes. And so <laughs> I will not be too long this Sabbath. But I just wanted to break some bread with you and share the word with you. Uh, not me giving to you, but us sharing together. And if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn to the passage of Philippians chapter 2. I will read in your hearing from the New American Standard Bible. Philippians chapter 2, and we'll start from verse 1, and we'll go through verse 4. And when you find it, please say amen. I don't know if there are any customs or traditions in this church, but if you wouldn't mind, I'll ask you to stand with me as we read the Holy Word, if that's okay. And I will read in your hearing. Therefore, 
If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. If I had to title the message today, it would just simply be, come down, come down, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I ask that you be with me. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength, you are our redeemer. May all of God's children say, amen. amen. You may be seated in the house of God. I'm so thankful for the season. I picked up this passage and as I began reading the pages, um, as my colleague Pastor Bernie assigned me, I had my own notion of what I would preach. And I loved the passage as Pastor Bernie told us about uncommon joy as we are looking at joy in this season. As I picked up the passage, I, I almost got locked into the trap of believing that uh, I would just only be focused on Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4. Uh, but I quickly understood that this was just a continuation of what Paul was trying to state in the end piece of Philippians chapter 1. It's also a part of the entire body of the letter. And so Paul, even starting in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, he begins to identify, uh, giving a salutation, a greeting to this group. And as he gives the greeting, as he gives the salutation, he starts off, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi. I can imagine the saints in Christ Jesus hearing the greeting and the salutation, grace to you and peace from God. They're excited as they're reading the letter. Uh, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, as Paul writes with the pen, always offering prayer with joy. I can also imagine the Philippians, uh, the citizens of Philippi, hearing this. Uh, we are proud citizens of Philippi. We are the mini Rome, if you will. Um, we are patriotic. Um, we are suspicious. We are. We live in a culture that is very suspicious of movements uh, that are not loyal to Caesar. Uh, this culture that they lived within was uh, quite anti-Semitic, as uh, many um, who preached good news, they were brought before chief magistrates and uh, were found to be in trouble for proclaiming customs that were against Rome. Uh, this Macedonian city could and did make life difficult for disciples of Christ. And as Paul says to the saints in Christ and to those in Philippi, I can see that he is referring to identities. Uh, he's speaking to a group. He's not speaking to two groups, but he's speaking to one group who happens to identify themselves in two manners, in two various distinctions. They are part of the body of Christ but they reside in the city of Philippi. Uh, Paul is talking to a group that could have identity issues. Uh, one group uh, talking about the saints and the other, they are citizens of Christ and they are uh, having these two identities merged together. And as he's talking about 
his struggle, as he's talking about what he is going through, as he is moving from certainty to uncertainty, as he's talking about desiring to live but also desiring to die, as he is dealing with mental anguish in prison, he writes to the people letting them know that to live is Christ, to die is gain. And as he writes the pen and he goes back and forth, he gets to a place, Philippians 1.27, where he begins to tell the Philippians a very important word. I'm concerned with lifestyle. I'm concerned with lifestyle. And I'm also concerned with the worthiness of this lifestyle in relation to the gospel. Uh, he's dealing with a group of Christians, uh, saints in Christ, who live in Philippi. And any time that you're dealing with multiple identities, you've got to be able to understand which identity has dominion or priority. As you're looking at this, he begins by saying, you are saints in Christ who are in Philippi. I've heard passages that speak, be in the world, but not of the world. And as he is breaking this down for them, as we think of identity, what is identity? Uh, what is this thing of identity? Um, it is basically derived from the Latin word uh, dem, which means same. Uh, uh, and when, when you look at this, um, your visible conduct should consistently reflect your inner character. This forms your identity. So you have an inner identity and an outer identity. The visible you, how you are known by others, your personality, your mass pretenses, outer appearance, and then the real you, how you are known by God, your basic nature, your character, your value system. There are times when we come into identity crisis, when we have questions as to who am I, what do I believe in, what value should I live by, what do I want to do with my life. Uh, many times loss of a job or loss of a loved one can bring about an identity crisis. And Paul is speaking because he's going through a point of anguish where the threat of losing identity is real. He is in prison and he wants to let the saints know that the experience I'm going through is not too far from you. And so I'm concerned with your lifestyle. I'm concerned with the worthiness of your calling, uh, lifestyle. Um, when you look at this word, lifestyle, and in, in the Greek, uh, this conduct, it is politeomai, um, and, 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 and it really has that root of polis, which is city, how you live your life in this place. Um, and then he has another word, uh, which is worthy, axios. Um, and, 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 and he is not referring to uh, worthiness in terms of an adjective of who you are, but it is, it is an adverb describing your worthiness to the calling of Christ. And so what Paul is pointing out in this passage as he talks in 127, he says, I want you to conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want your lifestyle to match up with the gospel. And it is interesting as Paul has hit an intersection in his life, he is saying to the Philippians, you too, if you travel a little bit, you too, if you keep moving from day to day, you too, as you go from season to season, will hit intersections where your lifestyle must be in congruence with the gospel in order for the community to see where you are coming from. The challenges that come from the community, such as oppression, such as uh, Paul is even imprisoned for his views and for his belief. These challenges that come from the outside, Paul is saying, I do not want these things to change and corrupt 
impact and, and, and negate the calling that is on your life, your lifestyle. It is not something that you determine for yourself. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. Your lifestyle, it is not something that you just say, this is what I'm going to be, but you have a calling and you are to live worthy of that calling. A lifestyle. Uh, can you imagine that the one who breathed life into you and, and, and caused you to be, formed you out of the ground and breathed into man the breath of life, causing him to become a living soul? He is looking for a return on his investment. And when you're looking at this lifestyle and worthiness, Paul going through the struggle at the intersection of Christian living and society, he does not give up on his lifestyle because of challenge. He does not give up on his calling because of obstacle. He does not give up on his calling because of imprisonment. But rather, he is encouraged that if there is to be any glory in Jesus Christ, in his life or in his death, it will come because he will not give up on the one who has created him. And so he admonishes the believers in verse 27, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. Paul wants the readers of Philippi to get in their head, you cannot let society dictate your unity. You cannot let society dictate your lifestyle. You cannot let Philippi or Rome or the Macedonian region tell you how you are going to be unified in Jesus. And this thinking, this mindset with Christ as the head and with us as the body, it causes Paul to move into the teaching in chapter 2 of Philippians. As he moves into chapter 2 after dealing with our lifestyle at the intersection of relationship in society. He begins by speaking to us how believers community should exist. The community of believers, that would be the community of Forest Lake. The community of believers, that would be the community of uh, the church I go, Mount Olive. Uh, the community of believers, that would be us as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, worldwide, whether it be local or worldwide, uh, our community of believers, wh whoever proclaims the name of Jesus, uh, there ought to be some unity uh, that says we are who we are. There ought to be a lifestyle that says this is who we are. And, and Paul, in breaking this down, he, in this title, is saying, be like Christ. Uh, Paul, I love how he does it. He does not want to be viewed as the mean preacher. How many of you don't like mean preachers? Uh, a preacher that can tell a joke every now and then. That can put a smile on their face every now and then. A preacher that knows how to put a happy face emoji on a letter. Uh, uh, they didn't have... Facebook and Twitter and, and, and Instagram back in those days, uh, all Paul had was a letter. And he could write this letter and he had the choice. He could say, I know that there's some challenges between uh, uh, two females in the church. I, I know that there's some issues uh, that, that, that uh, there are people coming from the outside, changing people's views on the gospel. Uh, maybe some people have some issues with me. And as he put the pen to the paper, he could have been the mean preacher. That said, I know all of these issues, and let's fix these issues now. But Paul is smarter than that. He's a very wise preacher, a very wise apostle, a very caring preacher, a very caring 
apostle. He begins to write from the perspective of a hypothetical. He says, if there be. Uh, in the Greek language, they would use this, if there be. And it could be, uh, yes, this is true. Uh, this is actually true. But he raises the hypothetical. And when he raises the hypothetical, he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete. Uh, I, I just want to focus on this piece right here. Uh, when he talks about the hypotheticals, what he's doing is he is bringing up the good in Christ. Uh, rather than being the pastor that says, do this because I say so, he focuses on the goodness of Jesus. And he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if we can live in the encouragement of Jesus amongst ourselves, if there is any consolation of love, uh, if we can comfort one another in the love of God, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, uh, the Spirit that comes into us, that causes us to have relationship even with one another in harmony and peace, if there is any affection, caring, uh, compassion, uh, letting the feelings of God meet the needs of those who are uh, uh, in want. Uh, if there is any of this, Paul says, but of course there is. I see it in you. I know it comes from God. It is evident in you. You practice, you practice this. If you have this, this is the foundation of any community succeeding. If you have these things, you will be okay. And Paul says, I know you have it. We're not operating in full in this. Therefore, I'm asking you. No, I'm commanding you because I see this in you. Make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. We have reached standards. We have reached heights. We have had success. We have hit goals. But there is still more to do. We, we may have thought we attained something, but we have not yet attained that which we are being apprehended for. Make my joy complete. Uh, Paul is commanding them an imperative, make my joy complete by the following four things. Be of the same mind. Maintain the same love. Be united in spirit. Be intent on one purpose. It's amazing how much can be done when a group comes together. It is amazing how much joy can take place in the lives of those who are watching when a group comes together. Uh, I used to watch the movie or the TV show, The A-Team. Uh, I don't smoke cigars, but I know uh, the leader of that group, he would have a cigar in his, in his mouth and he would always say the words, I love it when a plan comes together. Uh, a plan cannot come together if a group does not come together. And as you look at this, uh, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, being united in spirit, intent on one purpose, uh, the plan of God for the church, uh, his bride, it comes to fruition when the Spirit is moving and when each person is obedient to the Spirit of God. These four items that makes Paul's joy complete, they produce something. They produce an outcome. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit 
but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. He doesn't stop there. He then goes on to say, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. This others grabbed my mind because Paul talked about the Christian living in a society and the Christian intersecting with the place in which they live and how they are to stand firm and how they are to live in the grace knowing that they have received the faith of Christ and knowing that they must suffer for him. Uh, he is intent on saying the experience I have gone through, you too will experience them too. And he wants you to be steadfast, immovable, knowing that the trials will come at these intersections, but if you know your identity, you shall not be shaken. Then he moves on to say, uh, if we can be of one mind, the possibility of the community changing us, causing us to lose our identity and to have a crisis moment, are reduced if we are united together. It is powerful because Paul, in his teaching, is not teaching from a soapbox. He is not teaching from the one who is, 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 is trying to be the, the, the grand poobah, the one who is before everyone. He is teaching from experience and from jail, from prison, knowing that his life is soon to die. He wants the Philippians to know your time on this earth will be done soon. Let us be focused on our mission. It is powerful when I look at the outcomes of uh, not uh, viewing yourself as uh, uh, um, more than others, but esteeming others uh, better than yourself. And, 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 and not just being mindful of your own things, but being mindful of the things of others. Uh, practical things such as, does the neighbor besides you have enough to eat? Practical things as, uh, uh, does your neighbor have enough tuition this semester for their child? Practical things such as, do you need assistance with, with balancing your budget or do you need assistance with finding a job? Practical things, uh, not just focusing on me, but, but focusing on you. And if we can get in this season, as Pastor Bernie said, this is the most wonderful time of the year. People are filled with joy, and sometimes they don't even know why they're filled with joy. They see a Christmas tree go up, and lights in the tree, and they become ecstatic. But we as believers know why we have joy. We as believers know why we are here, because we have a Savior who is coming again for us. And even in this season, it is a story about how he loved us so much that he decided to come down. Paul gives allusion and foreshadowing to the mindset of Jesus Christ, who thought it not robbery to be like God, but he humbled himself and came down so that you and I could experience eternal life. It is that demonstration that has promoted and that has uh, uh, formed this unity of humility that takes the church from being a one-off to being the center of what the world is looking for today. Jesus Christ came down so that I might go up. Jesus Christ came down so that I could live. And it's powerful how David talks about it in Psalm 133. 
I love his image of unity. This image of unity that brings people together, that causes the believers to know what their purpose is. This, this image of unity that says, I'm not alone. This image, this image of unity that says, I will not leave you alone. This image of unity that says, though you may not have what you need, I am willing to help you and take care of you. It is this unity in the body that will turn the world around. It is this image of unity that lifts up Jesus as the focus. And everyone else becomes the, the, the supporting cast of the story. It is this unity of the body of Christ that gives meaning and purpose to why we are here today. David doesn't talk about unity in a normal fashion. If I may grab my brother right here and come stand with me. We look at unity many times in a simplistic term. If I'm here with my brother, we are unified. We are together such as a football team, we wear the same uniform, we have the same helmet, we may have different numbers, a little bit individual in our skill set. We are unified. We have this image of what unity is. But David has a unique view of unity, and I ask you to stay right here. He begins by describing how beautiful it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. He said it is like the oil that comes down the beard of Aaron, even coming down all the way down his body, covering up the ephod, which signifies, represents the children of Israel. And the oil comes down even as sweat comes down my face. He then goes on to say it is like the dew that comes down from Mount Hermon. Uh, the dew that comes down from Mount Hermon. Uh, this dew uh, doesn't just reside in the upper atmosphere, but it comes down to fill the entire region. What is David pointing out? What is the picture that David is trying to get across in this image? He says in the two images that something comes down. Something comes down, and by something coming down, things change. By something coming down, people are blessed. By something coming down, what was in a destitute state is now flourishing. Something has to come down. And unity is often experienced and understood as two like this. But the reason why David instills this Psalm 133 is to point out that unity has a coming down. There are moments in the body of Christ when a brother or a sister is in need. And they could have even hurt you and maybe done something against you. But it is the coming down moment that allows there to be unity. My brother may have done something to offend me. I could win the argument and say I'm right. Or I could give up the argument and come down. I could look at him and see he's in need. And I could get off of my high horse, my higher plane, and come down. You see, the oil was not just for the priest. The oil was for the people. The oil came down from Aaron. The anointing that Aaron had was not just for him, but it was for the people. The dew that was on Mount Hermon, it was not just so that it would fill the air and on the heights of Mount Hermon, but it would come down and saturate the valley. It would cause flowers and, and grass to bud and bloom. It would fill uh, 
uh, uh, the, 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 the road and the, 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 the rugged terrain of the lower mountains so that everything in the region could experience the blessing that came from above. When you experience unity in the body of Christ, it is because you are modeling the coming down of Jesus Christ. As he came down as a babe, gave his life to be the ransom of many. As he came down, joy filled the world. As Jesus said, I know we have odds and a, 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 a gap between us, but I love you so much that I'm going to commend my love to you that I'm coming to be unified with you today. Can you see the picture that David is painting? Can you see the significance of each and every one of us coming down, esteeming someone better than us, coming down, looking out for the interest of someone else? When the world sees that in the church, when the world sees that in the church, I don't know if you heard me, so I'm going to get my, 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 my contextualized African-American Jamaican preaching out. When the world sees that in the church, their joy will be complete. I challenge I admonish, I exhort, don't let the world change our unity. I challenge, I admonish, I exhort, live unified with brothers and sisters in Christ. I challenge, I admonish, I exhort, let the world see what they are in need of today. It's bigger than gifts. It's bigger than wrapping paper. It's bigger than St. Nicholas and hot chocolate. It's bigger than any of the world's uh, spin on this season. The church has the joy of Christ. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I'm asking that those who watch us, as we intersect with them in this journey, they will see one church. They will see a bride that is being prepared for her groom that they will see love in us, that they will see compassion and affection in us, that they will see humility in us, uh, that we would even take the time to be mindful of how we tweet information, that we would be mindful of how we post things on Facebook when we talk about the love of Jesus in relation to our community that they will see that we are so mindful and so loving of them. Lord, only because we are so mindful and loving of each other on the inside. Even as Paul wanted his joy to be full, Lord, we desire for you to see the best in us, development in us, growth in us, so that we will put a smile on your face. And Lord, the joy that you have given to us, may it not be snuffed out by the anxieties, the frustrations, the stress, the politics of this world. But may our joy be on full display, even as a candle on a hill, that the world will see you high and lifted up. We ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 God bless you.